Hi, everybody, and welcome to the latest in this series of podcasts from Export to Japan. Today, we're going to be looking in a bit more detail at the free trade agreement that's recently been signed between the UK and Japan. And in particular, we're going to focus on one of the most important sectors to benefit from that free trade agreement, and that is the food, drink, and agriculture sector. And to help us understand a little bit more from that sector,、um, I'm delighted to welcome Dominic Goody, who is the head of international trade at the Food and Drink Federation. Hi, Dominic, and welcome. Hi there, Steve. Great to be with you today. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for your time today. Now, I know you've got a little bit of background with, with regards to this agreement. I think it's something that you've been sort of working on or lobbying on a little bit in the background. Could you, could you tell us a little bit more about that, please, Dominic? Uh, certainly, yeah. So I, I was、uh, involved in the discussions around the original EU Japan trade deal、uh, a number of years ago. And this is something that we, as an industry in the UK,、uh, representing the UK's manufacturers of food and drink, pushed for very heavily because we saw a great opportunity for trade with Japan that was inhibited by the scale of the tariffs that businesses typically faced when exporting there.、Uh, Japan is the world's biggest net importer of food and drink. And as things stand still today,、uh, our exports don't measure up to where we think they could be. So we pushed heavily for that trade deal and were delighted when that came into effect in 2019. And we're even more delighted when DIT got over the line an updated version of that trade deal、uh, to apply without any break in effect. That's great. Yeah. And that, I just want to make sure you've, you've dropped straight in there. You've dropped a really interesting little snippet there. So let's just make sure we go over that again. I want to make sure we catch that correctly. Japan is the largest net importer of food and drink at any country in the world. Is that, is that right?、Uh, yes, it is. Yes.、Amazing. And it's uh, uh, something that we've really focused on. That there's clearly、uh, a need for them to import food and drink in the same way there is in the UK because their produc- productive capacity. Uh, faces certain limitations. So they need to go around the world and find quality, quality、uh, food and drink to keep their consumers fed.、Uh, and I think what we see when we look in detail at the market is that there are similar、uh, consumption patterns to the UK, that they're looking for quality, they're looking for healthier products. And with an aging population, there's a need for specialist dietary products. And I think there's a really good matchup between what we produce in the UK and what the, the consumers. In Japan, are actually buying that hasn't been、uh, as, as fully exploited as it possibly could do. So, we look at the, the data, and I think in 2020, our exports to Japan fell by about a fifth, largely, I think, because of impacts on the hospitality sectors and the reduction in、uh, tourists traveling.、Uh, but we know before that that the UK actually exported less food and drink to Japan than Denmark did. And when you look from country to country across the EU, it's a very similar picture that the UK is underperforming compared to countries that produce a similar sort of range of products.、Uh, and that's something that we want to address、uh, over the next few years. Yeah, and, and what a sort of powerful message of opportunity we're, you're, you're really bringing out from some of these points. So, what we're saying here, there is a great opportunity in the size of, of the market and, and Japan's need to import food products. The areas where Japan may be looking to import match some of the strengths that we've got. So,、uh, and now we've got this new free trade agreement in place. So, this is kind of opportunity time. Okay, well, that, that's great. That's set a good context for it. Now, if we think about for, for those sort of、uh, food and drink companies out there in the UK that might be now starting to think further afield with where they should be exporting to and, and clearly picking up the opportunity that Japan may present. What, at a sort of top level headline point of view, what sort of、um, details are within this new free trade agreement that may appeal and may, may make opportunity there for, for food and drink companies in the UK? So, I, I think the very first one and the, the biggest thing I think of this trade deal is that it gives us continuity. So, the big fear we had that was that there would be a break in application of the EU deal between、uh, us leaving the EU and securing a new deal. So, having that continuity is really key because there's a lot of businesses that have been working out in Japan for a number of years since that deal came into effect,、uh, looking to turn that into new business. So, first and foremost, that's the, the critical thing for us. When you look at the deal itself, things like tariffs are kept largely the same.、Uh, there are changes to some of the tariff rate quotas where there are volumes at reduced tariff rates that can go into Japan. And we've lost access to some of those tariff rate quotas. But in, in large part, 
those are not those, those are not products that we would typically be accessing. Uh, and where we do have access to some of the existing TRQs, uh, there are simplified processes to actually get those goods in that would be appealing to Japanese buyers. So I think that's the sort of first big one in terms of changes. I think the biggest positive that I've identified in the trade deal is around rules of origin. So those are the uh, complex terms and conditions that businesses need to meet to be able to access a preferential tariff. And what we see when we look at the rules of origin is that for food and drink, there's about six chapters where there are some changes to the rules of origin. In, in particular, uh, there are two categories that we focused on. And firstly, that is uh, baked goods and biscuits, where there are uh, more generous rules of origin that would allow producers greater flexibility about where they source their ingredients from. Uh, and secondly, for similar reasons, there's the, the pet food area. And for pet food, there's much more flexibility about where they source the meat, the fish, the cereals, the sugar from. Uh, and that gives businesses a great deal of flexibility to be able to source competitively priced, high quality raw materials, where buying just from the UK or just from the EU might place them in a difficult position because of seasonality uh, in order to take advantage of that trade deal. So we see, it, we see particular gains in the rules of origin that will be helpful. I think when you look ahead, there are also opportunities around geographical indications. And those are the protections given to particular regional uh, products from the UK. With the deal, I think there are seven of the existing UK geographical indications that maintain their protections uh, that were already covered by the EU deal. So that covers things like Stilton, cheese, um, West Country farmhouse cheddar cheese, Scotch whiskey, uh, Irish whiskey, Irish cream and the like. But the UK government has, has made a very strong statement of intent that they want to cover the full range of UK geographical indications. And having that cachet of quality going into the Japanese market offers a really great opportunity for a lot of those typically smaller producers to get into the Japanese market and to build their business. That's excellent. Yeah, that sounds really exciting. Um, okay, I mean, what? just so we can expand it a little bit more, and, and, and I realize there are so many different sort of food products going into Japan from the UK, but do you have any feeling on which, any sort of subsectors or, or particular areas of food product where we're, we're particularly good at exporting to Japan at the moment? At the moment, when you look at the trade stats, I think about two thirds of all of our exports are either Scotch whiskey or malt used wow. to make whiskey in Japan. Uh, and the rest of our uh, very varied sector uh, isn't producing a huge amount of exports in monetary value at the moment. Uh, but I think clearly, as I said before, given the scale of the opportunity in Japan, there is a really great, great chance for a lot of other businesses to get out of there. I think with the rules of origin, um, as, as I mentioned before, I think the, the baked goods sector and the pet food sector have a really good immediate opportunity. But I think the ones that really have that value capacity would be the meat sectors, the fish sectors, confectionery and other products like that. And confectionery in particular with its opportunity to sell into the gifting industry in Japan offers a really great opportunity for producers to go out to uh, Japan and really sort of tap into a luxury market. Yeah, that sounds good. And we're certainly seeing some examples through the work we're doing at Export to Japan, where, where companies in that particular sector are, are doing so well. And, and one thing we sort of note, um, you know, m moving into a bit more of the detail of what UK companies need to do in order to be successful in Japan, doing your sort of research and your homework um, up front is, is a key part of really understanding the market. And of course, organizations like DIT and other organizations out there are, are well equipped to give help with that. Um, we, we recently did a podcast with um, uh, a company called Walker's Shortbreads Limited, a very famous, iconic Scottish brand. And, uh, and Jim Walker, the, the, uh, he was the, he's the grandson of the founder of that organization, took us through some really good steps on what Walker's have done to become hugely successful. I mean, it's a massive export market for Walker's. And I would just urge anyone that's listening into this podcast right now that, that is getting inspired by what we're learning from Dominic here, and you want to start to look in a bit more detail at what, what the various steps are, the sort of unique steps you have to go through in order to be successful in Japan, have a listen to that podcast and, and learn from an expert 
expert there like Jim Walker, who's, who's been through the process himself. So um, that, that's a really good piece of content. But there's no doubt um, fr from what you're saying, Dominic, the opportunity is there. And, and I know your organization, you're doing all you can to, to spread the message and inspire companies. And certainly we, we want to be doing that as well. Um, I mean, fr from your perspective, what do you think um, we, we could or should be doing, you know, between your organization, organizations like ours with DIT, etc. What, what should we be doing as the next step to help these UK companies now go and really exploit this opportunity that's being presented? What would you like to, to see being done as the next steps? So, so I think, I mean, you highlight there a range of organizations that are doing a lot of different things to help our exporters. And when, when I look around, there's really no shortage of food and drink specialist bodies representing individual sectors. Uh, you've got ourselves that are the overarching umbrella body. Uh, there are people like the Food and Drink Exporters Association, who we work in close partnership. And of course, the DIT team in market, each of them doing various different things. And I think where, where I'd like to see uh, more activity is really pulling that all together into a really sort of coherent package that shows these people uh, are active in Japan and these people can help you in this way, whether it be providing uh, information and data to help, uh, help companies do their research and to understand the market, uh, or people that have boots on the ground in Japan that can talk them through the particular uh, nature of the, the commercial climate in Japan and how you actually do business out there, because there are cultural differences and businesses understanding that, as I'm sure Jim Walker would have said, mm -hmm. is really key for that success. So having a real, having a clear plan, as Jim, Jim set out, is really key. Uh, but knowing the right people who can help you and can help answer those questions is also a big help. And I think through the campaigns that DIT uh, is doing at the moment, uh, which we are very firmly tied up with, as, as you are too. I think that helps to um, start to sort of provide a clearer path for companies to get into the market and make life that bit easier for them to go out and sell over there. Brilliant. And I think that's a great point to, to, to sum up and finish this conversation, Dominic. And really, in summary, what I want to say to you is thank you for all the good work that you've done in the background uh, over a long period of time and, you, and your, your colleagues in your, in your association have done. And uh, clearly that has paid dividends by helping get this free trade agreement over the line. And, uh, and there are some huge benefits within it, as you've, as you've alluded to, and a very big opportunity out there in the Japanese market. So thank you for your time today. Really great to speak with you. And uh, obviously we look forward to continuing to work with you in a very joined up fashion, as you say. Uh, and let's work together to get more of these food and drink companies, these great companies we have here in the UK um, on this mission to get out to Japan and, and increase our, our slice of the market out there. So thank you so much for your time today, Dominic. It's been a pleasure catching up with you. Thank you. Thank you, Steve.